Well, praise God, we're still on this idea of Jesus is coming in 2030. I'm not setting dates or anything. It could be 2034, but it sure seems like it's coming down the pike. And uh, let's just open with prayer. Lord, we praise you and we thank you. We thank you for the time we got to worship before we came to this part, Father God. And we just give you all the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Praise you, Lord God. Praise you. We worship you. Just uh, anoint this word and uh, open people's ears and their hearts as we speak it. Um, these are certainly um, maybe not dangerous times, but they're they're uh, they're really in the spirit realm. They're very dangerous times, and we just praise you and give you the glory because He that's in us is greater than He that's in this world. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Well, we just got to sing some worship songs. We're, we apologize we can't put those on because they're copyrighted, so we do worship before. But uh, it says that we should come together and worship, uh, and that's what we do. So we worshiped before, and now we're going into the Word. Ephesians 1.3 said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God had this all worked out prior to uh, prior to even creating the universe, creating the world. Um, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Um, before even he built the foundations of the world. There's always a foundation first, but even before he built the foundation of this world, um, he chose us in Him that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. And of course, that comes not by our own actions, but because of Jesus Christ and the price that Christ paid and our acceptance in Christ. And if you don't know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you need to give your life to Him. You just repent of your sin, recognize you're a sinner, and recognize the sins that you are aware of in your life. There'll be more as you grow in Christ. He'll reveal more things that you need to work through. But but um, our righteousness is not in ourselves. Our righteousness is in Christ Jesus. So He created this whole thing so that we could be holy and without blame before Him and in love that we should be in love with Him, be in relationship with Him. And I'm looking forward to an eternity of love and relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ and His powerful Holy Spirit. God's not limited as we are with the restrictions of time, of the time continuum. Even before the fall, God had a plan for mankind's redemption. All throughout Scripture, God has carefully placed His plan of salvation. Even from the very beginning, the serious seeker can find the hidden elements of the gospel in the Old Testament. Um, Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, God is, and that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. You have to believe that as you seek him diligently, he's going to reveal himself to you. He's going to reward you. And it's very important that we be seekers of God. Amos 3, 7, I love this. Uh, all these people say that uh, we can't know when the end is going to be and that sort of thing. Um, and we don't know the day or the hour, that's for certain, but uh, we do know the seasons and the times. And it appears we're in that time now. But Amos 3, 7 says, Surely the Lord God does nothing. Now remember, God doesn't change ever. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He reveals His secret to His servants, the prophets. So, um, He's revealing things, even to me, as I study the Word of God. And I told you that we'll talk about it, but I want to give a whole lesson to it. So um, so we're not speaking about it today, but I said last time we were together that we would learn more about the 144,000. I think it's real clear in the Scriptures who they are. And i be honest with you, I think most everybody has it wrong because they've jumped to conclusions, and then those conclusions are passed on from person to person to person. And... Uh, as an engineer, you know, my degree is engineering. I managed engineering for 30 years before I went into the ministry. And um, and so I must find things very logically, and I like to go through them very... I think God's a very logical God. I took statistics in my postgraduate work, and... and uh, I just believe that everything is numbered out, you know, just the way the universe travels. 
and uh, how everything stays right where it's supposed to stay and things happen as they're supposed to happen and uh, I, I think it's I think it's great it's just incredible but our God has placed these things in the Bible and I'm going to show you just one of them today that's going to be kind of fun to go through and then we'll go into some other stuff but I'll get back to the 144,000 keep that on your plate because um, I think it's very clear who they are but Proverbs 26 2 and 3 and I've mentioned this before and I'll mention again even tonight but it is the glory of God to conceal a matter <clears throat> to search out a matter is the glory of kings so it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. So he's hidden these things all throughout the scriptures. And, uh, but it's, it's the matter of, uh, to search out the matter is the glory of kings. And we're king's kids. We're, we're God's kids and we're going to search out these matters. They're there for us if we just work on them and search them out. The term gospel, um, or as we translate it in English, good news, <clears throat> speaks in the New Testament of God's message of salvation. But where it first but where it first in the, appears in the Bible may surprise you. The most remarkable document ever created, the Bible is 66 books written down by 40 men over thousands of years. 2 Timothy 3:16 complains proclaims all scripture is God breathed. <clears throat> so these 40 men over thousands of years the 66 books written down by them um, all jive and don't conflict with the, each other at all <clears throat> because it's all God-breathed. It was all God-breathed. <clears throat> we can find comfort in the veracity of the th first 39 books of the Bible because our Lord Jesus Christ repeatedly referred to and affirmed the Old Testament. And we can also believe in the New Testament because the 27 books penned by his apostles were in fact authorized by the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the Bible clearly bears witness to its supernatural engineering. No other religious book accurately predicts the future as perfectly as the Bible does. And I could go on and on with how this is, uh, these prophecies are given and then fulfilled. Um, Jesus filled so many of, fulfilled so many of the Old Testament prophecies that spoke of who he was. And it's a shame, I guess, that Israel missed it. Um, Nicodemus got it. But so many people um, in the old religious times of, of Christ's time on earth here, they just missed it. And uh, I don't want to miss these things. I want to study it and I want to find out these things that God has us, for us. In many places, he provides exact, precise dates with details. And I could take you through some of those um, that literally goes over hundreds of years. It's literally a supernaturally designed wealth of knowledge and information system far more complex and advanced than any technology man could ever produce. For example, if you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 5, um, I'll ask you a question before you really read it. <clears throat> before looking, can you recall any details in Genesis 5? Does anybody here know? I mean, they probably know Genesis 6 because of Noah and that sort of thing. But what about Genesis 5? You know what? Genesis 5 is full of genealogies from Adam through Noah. Most of us have read this chapter several times, but few have made a deep study of it, primarily because it's just a lot of names and numbers and, and uh, doesn't make a lot of, I guess, it makes sense, but maybe doesn't uh, relate to our day-to-day -day lives. But I want to show you something that... Just as I said earlier, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search out a matter is the glory of kings. As the heavens are high and the earth is deep, so the hearts of kings are unsearchable. So, you know, if you're one of God's children, you should have a heart for just studying this stuff and finding this stuff out. It's not that that saves us. It's the blood of Jesus and repentance that saves us from the destruction and the wrath of God that we deserve. But it's very encouraging. The Word of God just in, increases our faith as we find more and more things in it that prove itself to us. And God doesn't need to prove His Word to us, but it sure is fun to find out the things that He has for us hidden in His Word. Most of the names in, in Genesis 5 can be translated <coughs> Uh, providing a deeper meaning to the person in the situation in the scripture story. 
These meanings can lend interesting insight and understanding to the individual mentioned in the story being conveyed in the Bible. Here's a couple of examples of Bible names and their meaning that you may or may not know. Isaiah names, Isaiah's name translates to the Lord saves. Jehovah saves, the Lord saves. Abraham is father of many or father of a multitude. That's the Hebrew meaning of those. Can you imagine walking around every day and everybody says, hey, father of multitudes, father of many. Now think of what that would do to your faith. Now, when he was ancient, nearly 100 years old and he had no children yet and Sarah had her womb was dried up and and they say hey father of many that's what Abraham meant father of multitudes and it would either say okay God has promised me this because he gave me that name because his name was just Abram before he had the Abraham was added by God he was father now he's father of a multitude and God added that to me so everybody's calling me that that's what's going to happen Jesus name in Hebrew is Joshua meaning the Lord delivers and uh, just just before Jesus's birth the angel of the Lord came to Joseph in a dream and proclaimed they will call his name Emmanuel which means God is with us it is from Matthew 1 23 so these names all have meaning I, I have a wonderful time witnessing to young men whose name is Josh and I'll ask them if they know what Joshua means and most of them don't interestingly enough their parents picked it because of some relative or some TV show or whatever and you tell them it's the Hebrew word for Jesus it just shocks them but and then I say well it means deliverer because Joshua was the appointed deliverer uh, to take the people into the promised land and so but without the name Joshua Messiah or as it would be pronounced Yeshua Messiah without the Messiah part that means the anointed one so he was the anointed deliverer Jesus Christ is the anointed deliverer that's what Jesus means the deliverer and this is in uh, Greek and Christ means Christ means anointed so Jesus was the anointed deliverer up to that time there was a lot of kids named Joshua or Yeshua or Jesus um, we were just at a theme park and um, I just <laughs> this is probably silly but I just love the minions and the silly things the despicable me minions and um, there's probably some reason deep hidden reason I don't know but but I just love them and they were picking out key chains key fobs at this place that uh, that had minions on them and one of them said uh, Jesus on it and they got me one that says dad and stuff like that I thought it was fun my kids got them for me grandkids and stuff but but I said oh this is cool this one has it says Jesus on it and later my wife corrected me my wife has uh, got some Hispanic in her and she said that's not Jesus that's Jesus that's for all the Hispanic people that <laughs> so I thought I was getting a Jesus one but I guess it means Jesus but I'll I'll carry it proudly in the name of Jesus but anyhow um, but it all has meaning and uh, to a Hispanic person named Jesus if I said to them do you know your name means deliverer and they I just get this blank stare they have they knew they were named after Jesus but they didn't know but so many people were named Jesus or Jesus or Joshua back in the days of Christ but it was until Christ came that he became Emmanuel God is with us he became Jesus the Christ the anointed one um, so but back to the gene genealogy that we were in Genesis 5 look at the names and their meanings and then we'll put them together to reveal God's hidden message in them and you know maybe some of you have done this before the first time I saw it uh, it was from Chuck Missler who I just thought was great he passed away now but he's just a great teacher and, and I kind of mentally aligned myself with him I never knew him or never met him but um, he was an engineering manager for most of his life and uh, and he was a great Bible teacher just incredible Bible teacher but um, I saw that he, he had a message on this the hidden messages in Genesis but um, let's go back to our first friend Adam Adam's name means man pretty simple straightforward Seth Adam's sons means appointed Enosh Seth's son means mortal frail or miserable Kenyon 
Enosh's son's name means sorrow. Mahal I, I always have trouble. Mahalalel's son, Jared. Oh, Kenyon's son was Mahalalel, which means blessed or praised. El means God. Uh, if you use, take his whole name, it means blessed God. Okay, the blessed God. It's like when I run into somebody named Michael, I'll ask him, do you know what your name means? And they'll say, no, I'm not sure. Isn't it named after Michael the Archangel? I says, well, it's actually two Hebrew words, Micah, which means shines like, and El means the Lord. Um, so his, somebody named Michael, his name is going to be shines like the Lord. And I say, I tell the guys, I said, go home and tell your wife that, that some pastor tell, told me today that you shine like the Lord. But um, anyhow, uh, Mahalalel's son Jared's name comes from the Hebrew Yarad, I can't even pronounce it, meaning shall come down. Jared's son was Enoch, we've all heard of Enoch, which means teaching or commencement. Enoch's son was Methuselah, we've always heard of Methuselah because he lived the longest of anybody. Comes from two words, Muth, meaning death, and Shalah, <coughs> meaning to bring. So Methuselah's name, Methuselah, Methuselah's name means his death shall bring. And of course, that meant that was the prophecy that his death shall bring the flood. But his death shall bring when he died. Then soon after that, the flood came. Um, Methuselah's son, Lamech, means to lament, or just as it sounds, lamentation or to despair. And Lamech's son Noah is derived from Nahum to bring relief or comfort. So, um, so I just said all that, and you're saying, well, okay, what's that mean? Well, let's go back through it real quickly, and then I'll put them together, and you'll see what it says. Now, remember, this is God prophesying the gospel in the Old Testament. Adam, man, Seth appointed, Enosh, mortal, Kenyan, sorrow, Mahalalel, the blessed God, Jared shall come, Enoch teaching, his death, Methuselah, his death shall bring, Lamech, those despairing, and Noah, rest and comfort. So when you put these together, in this, you get this following scenario. Man is appointed to mortal sour, sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching, his death shall bring those despairing rest and comfort. You see how that's the prophecy of, of the gospel. Man is appointed to mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, that's Jesus, so come down teaching his death shall bring those despairing rest and comfort. Wow, praise God. For the serious seeker, a uh, seemingly insignificant list of names can clearly reveal God's future plan for redemption, the gospel message. Last time we were together, I spoke of the many places in scriptures where we plainly see the texts that support the 6,000 year timeline of man on earth and the coming of 1,000 year millennial reign of Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and on the throne of King David. And how in the meantime, Satan's doing all he can to prevent this from coming to pass, knowing, oops, got too far there. Okay. Okay, how in the meantime, uh, Satan's doing all he can to prevent this from coming to pass, knowing he, he'll be locked up in the abyss, <coughs> excuse me, while Jesus uh, <coughs> reigns for a thousand years. And, well, recently I realized another one of Satan's attempt to stop Jesus' return for his bride lurking on the horizon. <coughs> it's commonly called going woke. Now, when I first saw this, I thought, oh, now there's a sermon I need to teach on going woke. And uh, find out more about it. And uh, Jesus spoke of in the increasing times in the Olivet Discourse, deception, interracial conflict, and sexual perversion would come. And uh, and what I was surprised is that there's, uh, there's churches that are the going woke is creeping into the churches. I, I, I was surprised as I began to I, I began to research this, I found uh, two or three pastors that um, said they're actually atheists. They preach in Christians, in evangelical Christian churches, and uh, their last names aren't given or the churches aren't given, but they said that they were they were going woke because it didn't bother them at all because they didn't believe there was a God anyway. And here, and they, said, they asked them in the interview, um, why are you still 
preaching. Why don't you go do something else? And they said, well, I'm trained to be a preacher. I don't know anything else. And so I run it like an organization. That was pretty much the three answers were for the money, for the salary. And they had no other op uh, options. <clears throat> so remember in Jude's letter, uh, in verse 3, there's only one chapter, so it'd be 1-3. Um, I became concerned that this going woke will be creeping into the church. Jude, Jude said this in verse 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write you, to exhort you, to contend earnestly for the faith, faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and de deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And what we're finding is, in my research, I began to find church after church that is starting to embrace some of these woke these, these woke ethics, if you can call them that. They're certainly not scriptural. So as I began to research, I discovered it became disturbingly quite widespread. And, and not just in the mainline denominational churches, which we might expect, but also now in the evangelical churches. My first reaction was to begin to list the things happening in these churches um, to, to bring to light some of the stuff that's going on. Churches that are embracing some of these, these bad, bad things that are going on. And... Uh, then I thought of the great falling away and the great apostasy prophesied in 2 Thessalonians 2.3 and the parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13 and letting the angels do their work and rooting out the tares. Could this be a manifestation of the end times we've been talking about? Could the great apostasy be this woke stuff? I was, I've always thought the great falling away would be more obvious like Jude says, but like Jesus said, they're sneaking in. And Paul warns us of this in Colossians 2. Colossians 2, 8 and 9, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. It's creeping into the church. Jude warned us it would creep into the church from ungodly men that pretend to be godly. Paul says it's going to creep in through intellectual people that try and make intellectual arguments. I've listened to some debates on, on the internet of, of uh, Christian people debating um, so-called Christian people about things like homosexuality and that sort of thing. And, um, and this one lady went to she was a theologian and she went to she was a minister and she'd gone to some of the if i mentioned the colleges they're famous worldwide colleges from europe that she got her theological degree from and she said you know i always had a problem i always liked women more than men i was always attracted to women so i was looking and looking for some place in the bible that would tell me that that was okay can you imagine that she was educated in the scriptures uh, with master's and doctorate degrees, and she was attracted to ladies, and uh, she was looking for somewhere in the Bible that would okay that. So this woke stuff is creeping in to the church. This is so sneaky, and they're rationalizing in man's thinking rather than God's word. It says that, that they, would, they would be according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Christ is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Christ is the Word, and the basic principles of the world are our rationalizations. That's the very thing that Satan used with Eve. He began to rationalize. God said this, but, but Satan said, surely he doesn't mean that. And that's what's going on right now, is that God said in His Word some very specific things about these sins and, and how it will end up leading to damnation. And uh, they're looking for ways to rationalize it away. But it's so complicated, and their minds and their thinking is 
is correct so arguing is in their minds they're thinking is correct so arguing with them is fruitless second timothy 2 23 said avoid foolish and ignorant disputes knowing that they generate strife and a servant of the lord must not quarrel but be gentle to all able to teach patient in humility correcting those who are in opposition if god perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth did you hear what that said Avoid foolish and ignorant arguments because it's not going to do anything. It's not going to accomplish anything. But this, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patience and humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Now, see, it gives us that opening. We are to correct them. We are to correct them. If God perhaps will grant them the repentance so they may know the truth. It's just like um, it says in the Bible that, that God's a good father and he, he corrects his children. And you say, you know, does God do that? People want to make God this this lollipop God that doesn't do anything like that. But it says he wouldn't be a good father if he didn't discipline his children. And how does he discipline them? Well, on earth, we're disciplined by um, cause and effect actions. We do a sin and then we have to pay a price. If we don't cover it with the blood of Jesus, if we don't break off the curse that comes with it, if we don't repent and, and turn it over to God, then we're going to pay some we're going to pay some uh, consequences. It's just like when my children were growing up, and of course they're all grown adults now. I have ten grandkids, but um, if if one was going to run out in the street and I'd grab him and bring him in the house and paddle his bottom and say, "Don't run out in the street," and and I can remember my dad saying to me, "This is going to hurt me more than it did hurt you." And what it is, it's it's a difficult thing to do to discipline your children, but if you don't, then they're going to get hit by a car. So it's it's uh, it's a difficult it's a difficult thing to discipline, but without discipline, that you don't have it. So I prayed and I asked the Lord, "What do we do?" And I was reminded of the call to battle in Ephesians six, and the fact that we're not fighting people; we're fighting against enemies in high and dark places. Satan is desperate, and the enemy is going full out in these last days. When Jesus came, the religious leaders of that day had complicated the law to fit their own benefit. So Jesus did exactly what he should be, what we should be doing. He spent a lot of time in prayer, fighting the enemy, and he boiled down the law to two simple conditions. Not adding more do nots, he simplified it with two things to do. Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. We're so busy trying to figure out what we shouldn't do, we might not be emphasizing enough what we should do. John Wesley put it this way. I, I, I did, stumbled onto this when I was first saved in a public library. It was lunchtime, and I was taking my lunch at the public library across the street from our office, and, and I found a whole section on John Wesley's books. And uh, he had a whole series called John Wesley's Short Sermon, or Sermon <coughs> Salvation Messages. <coughs> His... <coughs> His sermons on salvation, and uh, one of the ones that just I just remembered, and I can't forget, it was from Deuteronomy six. If we, and he said, if we love the Lord with all our heart, we'll have no desire to sin. If we love the Lord with all our mind, we'll have no thought for sin. And if we love the Lord with all our strength, we'll have no energy left for sin. And I like to add, if we love our neighbors as ourselves, we'll be so busy we'll have no time to sin. <coughs> but. <clears throat> What Jesus was saying to them when he came down is he says, it's not about all these laws you've manufactured and added on to the Ten Commandments and all this. <clears throat> they're there to do what? It says in Thessalonians, they're there to reveal you, to you that you can't do it. You can't keep these laws. There's, it's just not possible. So Jesus said, don't worry about all the do nots. Focus on what the do's. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind and your strength, all your strength and your neighbors yourself. And that will fill you so full that there's not room for the do nots to happen in your life. So focus on the do's and not the do nots. So how do I love the Lord with all my heart? Well, I focus on him. I, I read his word. I study it. Um, I often fall asleep at night with uh, my earbuds in listening to, to a sermon or to scriptures or to healing scriptures or psalms or or something of that nature, praise and worship songs, 
things that I want inside my head when I'm going to sleep. And then if we love the Lord with all our mind, if, if we fill our mind through his word, that drives out. It says uh, in Timothy, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Well, love, power, it gives us spirit of, spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Power is the Holy Spirit. That's this dunamis. That's the word that Jesus said, wait till the dunamis comes. That's the Holy Spirit. Love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We should love because we know that we are loved. We love because God first loved us. We need to, and, and Paul said, you know, we just don't know the, the length, the breadth, the depth, or the height of God's love for us. And he says, help us, Lord, to, he prayed for the church, help us to, to be able to comprehend how great this love is. Because again, if we can get involved in his love for us through his word, and see how much he loves us and what he the price he paid for us then we can love others we love because he first loved us but we have to we have to understand that love and so many of us were raised in in the beliefs of of the law and punishment and a mean god and it's difficult for us to move that comprehension from from that to the love and that's what that's why Paul prayed for the church. He prayed for the church in the church in Ephesus that they would begin to comprehend that love because he knew that they were full of the the do's nots and all the don'ts that and and the Pharisees and all the Sadducees and all this the scribes. Everybody was pushing this junk on them continually, well beyond what the scripture said, because they were using man's philosophies man's ideologies man's thinking and use that on these people and it seemed logical but what they were missing was the love of god they missed the love of god and how much god loved them so power is the holy spirit love is the father's love for us because once we trust the father loves us entirely then we can go do whatever he calls us to do but then a sound mind, which is Jesus Christ, because in the beginning it was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's the Word. We get a sound mind through the Word of God, because our minds are, are earthly driven, is man logic, man's philosophies. And to drive that out, we have to fill our minds with the Word of God. And that, that's a daily exercise, because all day long, we get input all day long from the world, from news, from people overreacting to us, to all kinds of things. And um, today I was picking up uh, a pizza for our sound man. And, uh, and for whatever reason, the pizza wasn't ready and it was supposed to be ready. And um, the guy recognized me because I get it, you know, for our youth group and I get it for our sound man on, on uh, Fridays. And, and when I, when I walked up, the guy was helping someone else, a lady, and um, and he stopped helping her and turned to me because he knew me and he knew that I would hurry up and pay and be gone. Well, it was just it was an interesting thing because the lady, she's kind of a, I don't know, I don't want to say she she obviously had a weight problem, but she was probably in her 60s or 70s, and she turned to me and she said. Um, Oh, do you always cut in front of people like this? And I said, well, I come here twice a week, and he just recognized me. She says, oh, so you cut in front of people twice a week? <laughs> and I said, oh. And she went and sat down, and then he went to help me, and the pizzas hadn't been made yet. He forgot to make them. They were supposed to be due at 4, and it was now it was 10 after 4. And they said, oh, we didn't make them yet. We better make them. So they went to make them, and then so... As I was finally ready to leave, this lady and what appeared to be her daughter were leaving at the same time. And, and uh, I said, well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut in front of you. I, you know, I told her some of the things that were going on and I said, I was kind of frazzled today and I was kind of in a hurry. But as it turns out, the pieces weren't even ready. And she kind of laughed and she says, well, I just need to apologize to you because I shouldn't have made that smart aleck remark to you. And I said, I said, oh, really? I said, well, we were just getting the pizza for our sound guy at the Bible study because uh, he comes right over and doesn't have time to eat. So, <laughs> so she's, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you know, because now I'm a religious guy, right? And and I give her my card. It says somebody loves you. His name is Jesus. And she says, oh, well, please forgive me, please forgive me. 
But while I was waiting for the pizzas to be made, I was sitting there going through this inventory of men's philosophy in my mind. I say, oh, I can't talk to that lady. She's, you know, she's not going to respond. And, you know, and, and the Lord kept prompting me, give her your card and tell her about Jesus. And I, oh, Lord, she's not going to listen to me. You know, that was all the philosophy of man. But God kept telling me through the spirit that I needed to, to talk with her. And it, just as it ended up, because our pieces weren't done, they both got done at the same time because she had just come in and ordered them. And ours weren't made, which were supposed to have already been made. So now we find ourselves going out the door at the same time. And, and the Lord said, you, I told you to talk to her. I said, okay, I talked to her. And so, um, and I, you know, it's a still small voice that comes and says, and so uh, I start talking to her and it was completely different because the Lord knew what he was gonna do with that. And I thought something else, and that's the trouble. We get in our minds these philosophies of men, these logical thinking, and the Bible's very logical. It's undisputably logical, but we don't think about that. We think about what we believe. And so what I, I say all that to say that day to day, we're confronted with things of the world. And if we're not in the scriptures on a day to day basis, then we're missing something. We're starving our souls is what we're doing. And most of us do a pretty good job of feeding our bodies and we starve our souls. But John chapter three says, and you know this one, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's John 3, 16 and 17. This is God's statement of his unconditional love for all the world. And, and this is one of the most commonly known scriptures, both in our Christian, supposedly Christian nation and other nations. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But, and we should have that same love for everyone, even our enemies. For God so loved the world. He loved the, some of the most despicable people that have ever been on earth. He loved them with an incredible love, so much so that he came and died for them and for their sin. So his unconditional love for all the world. And we should have that same love for everyone, even our enemies. But the woke crowd distorts this. Because we also need to be reminded that even though this God of love is unconditional, his salvation is not unconditional. His salvation is conditioned on Jesus redeeming us through our repentance. See, he's got an unconditional love for everyone. But the salvation is not unconditional. It's very clear in the Bible that salvation is conditional based on Jesus Christ and, and our repentance. Those who continue in their sin and defend it will not be saved. God's justice is pure and simple. Accept the salvation offered to you by Jesus. Repent of your sinful behavior. Yes, we all, it seems, struggle with sin. But do, but do we recognize it and live in a continuous state of repentance? Or do we defend our sin and continue it? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, we're going to continue to struggle with sin. But do we recognize it as sin and then live in a continuous state of repentance? Or we continually ask the Lord, forgive me. Or we continue asking the people around me to forgive me. See, I went to that lady and said, forgive me for cutting in line in front of you. I didn't mean to. And I thought it before I got up there, I thought of all the rationale. Well, he knows me. And, you know, I was, no, that wasn't, none of that was necessary. None of that was necessary because the instant I said that I was in a hurry to get to my Bible study, everything changed. And she felt convicted. And then she began to apologize to me for her, for her uh, words that she said. And so, do we live in a continuous state of repentance? Not rationale. See, I could rationalize away why that happened, but I needed to repent. Or, and here's the problem, do we defend our sin and continue in it? That's the problem. See, God loves us with an unconditional love, but he has conditions on heaven and salvation. God's conditional love is there for us, but our salvation is continued contingent on her heart attitude. Now I want to read this to you from Jeremiah 31, 31. This is the, this is the new covenant that God has made. We all know the, the first covenant. Well, we don't 
not everybody. There was a covenant made with Abraham. There was a covenant made with Moses and the law. But in Jeremiah 31, God said, I'm going to cut a new covenant. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. This is Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days of Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, <clears throat> says the Lord, verse 33, but this is my covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put, now remember, we as Christians are grafted into that covenant with Israel, okay? I will put my law in their minds, I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their inequity and their sin I will remember no more. You see what it says? I will put my law in their minds and I will put their law on their hearts. If we love the Lord with all our heart and with all our mind, you see that? How it's, it's covered. These people know what they're doing is wrong. God gave the law to expose our sin so we can repent and be saved. So we don't run out in the street and get hit by a car. So we don't do the things that are going to cause us to destroy a nation, destroy our families, destroy relationships. God gave us the law to expose our sin so we can repent and be saved. That's why the devil works so hard to remove the law from all the public places and out of people's lives and get, get them to stop going to church and get them to quite quit hearing the Word of God. But God says we'll know in our hearts, in the heart of our heart, in, in the heart of our hearts, what's right and what's wrong. That unless, now let me put a caveat on that, that is unless we've ignored it so long that we've been given over to a reprobate mind. Romans 1.28 says, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God and His Word, God gave them to a depraved mind to those things to do those things which are not proper. Now, who's that sound like today? Just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God and His Word. You know, all these people, there is no God. There is no God. There is no rules. There's nothing. And, and all the rules are falling apart. Somebody said, Why do we naturally keep rules if there's... If there's no God, if I'm an atheist and I believe, why don't I just steal and rob and all that? And now we're beginning to see when the word has been taken away, when the laws have been taken down, what's going on? People are, are robbing stores. They're walking in and just taking out baskets full of stuff that doesn't belong to them. And the employees that try, try to stop them get fired for trying to stop them. People are in the streets breaking and, and destroying things. You see, what happens is when the law is removed, when the law isn't there, when it's not been taught to these people, then it all, excuse me, all hell breaks loose. We're killing babies by the tens of thousands every year. Millions throughout the whole earth have been destroyed through abortion. And somehow people rationalize that in a way that, that it's the most important thing for me to do. God has given them over to depraved minds to do things that are not proper. That's a nice way of putting it. It's not proper. It's, it's very mild compared to what's going on today. So it's written in our hearts and it's written in our minds under the new covenant what's right and what's wrong. The question is, what have we done with it? Because if we don't pay attention to it, it's like a scar grows over that part of our thinking and we no longer care. The Word of God is very explicit with regards to these things. Listen to this list, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortionists will inherit the kingdom of God. That kind of covers all the bases of everything we see on the news anymore. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? 
Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But then listen what he says. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. See, there's hope. There's hope. It's the same thing. These are the rules. The rules are these people are not going to heaven unless they become one of these people that are justified through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. They just aren't going to make it. They're going to make it to the other place, which I wouldn't wish on anyone. This is a very extensive list of those not welcomed in heaven. Not welcomed in heaven. I remember I was witnessing to a man that uh, that was obviously a homosexual. And, and as I was witnessing to him, he said, oh, you're one of those Pauline Christians. And I said, what? He says, yeah, in our church, we don't believe in any of those Pauline epistles at all. We've taken those out of our scriptures. He says, we're not, we're not Pauline Christians. You're a Pauline Christian. You believe those things are in the Bible. Well, yeah, I believe they're in the Bible. How would they have survived for thousands of years if they weren't there? I mean, God has the power to cut things out if he doesn't want them in there. But that's not who cut these things out. That guy cut these out. And the, and the Lord doesn't approve of him cutting out, but he's turned himself to a reprobate mind. He's, he's denied those things. And, and the problem is, it's not just here. In, in the Old Testament, it was even more extreme. But assuming you are repentant, um, very simply corrected by the last verse, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. As you do your best to share the truth, where and when possible and to whom possible, always remember what Jesus told Peter. And this is my closing. Matthew 16, 18. And I, Jesus, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The great gates of Hades, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Knowing that when this is all over, as always, God has the victory. So, what do we do? We pray a lot. We battle in the heavenlies a lot. That's what Daniel, that's what we found Daniel doing when the angel came to him. And he says, I was delayed in this battle, but I came. He was praying for his nation. Pray for your nation. Pray for these lost people. Pray for the individuals that you know that are desperately in need of salvation. Pray for those that have been blinded and that, that, that their hearts won't turn reprobate, that they'll, they won't turn um, to these despicable situations and rationalize them. Just keep them in prayer. And then whenever it's possible to share the truth, share the truth. The law is what causes people to be saved. Now, it sounds funny because Jesus Christ, of course, in His forgiveness, His blood, His sacrifice, that's what saves us. But we don't go there until we find out what we're doing is wrong. Paul said that. He said, I didn't even know I was a sinner until... Uh, he was killing Christians. He said, I didn't even know I was a sinner until the word was exposed to me, until I was confronted by Christ. He thought he was keeping the law. He thought he was keeping the law, and, and he totally misunderstood the heart of God. The law, is to, the law is not to save us. We can't keep the law. The law is to reveal to us that we're breaking the law. But anyhow... Let me close with a little humor because of the law. I was thinking of a stop sign. I explained this to my granddaughter the other day who's now getting working on getting her license. And, and I didn't know whether she would get it or not, but uh, these two elderly ladies were in a car and they were going quite slow and the policeman pulled them over and he said, lady, you're going well below the speed limit. The minimum speed limit on this highway is 40 miles per hour. And she says, oh, no, no, I just saw a sign that said 15. And he says, no, this is Highway 15. <laughs> and what you saw was a highway sign, not a speed limit sign. And the other lady let out a deep sigh. And, and just she had she'd been 
just flush and 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 this color was coming back to her and the policeman said ma'am what's wrong can i help you and she says no that just explains something to me and he says what's that she says we just got off of highway 120. <laughs> <laughs> so the law is out there to help us to know what we're doing and we need to follow the right laws and read the right laws and it'll help us to understand so we keep ourselves out of trouble and that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, we praise you and we thank you and we give you all the glory. Help people to understand what's being said here, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.